It's an interesting concept that Peter puts out in this letter that he writes, this epistle, about people that belong to Jesus, belong to Jesus God's people. Um, it's an interesting concept that God tells us that this world's not our home. He's made us for something else. He's made us for himself and for another place. And to not be too comfortable in this world, not latch yourself to its ideals and its values and its priorities, not want everything this world wants, but long for something more. Long to be who God made you to be and what God made you for. God's planted in every person eternity. A, a desire for something more than the stuff that they can see. More than the stuff they can get their arms around or even their mind around. And this eternity is, well, it's for everybody. Everyone's going to spend it somewhere. And for those who are in Christ, we know what God has promised us. He's promised us an inheritance in heaven that can never spoil, never fade, and cannot be taken from us because God himself keeps it for us. So we begin to think about these concepts, we begin to see our, our time and life in this world a little bit differently. Peter uses words like on exile or on your sojourn here. During this temporary period while you're here, there's a way that you ought to live. And that's what we're going to look at today. I'm going to ask if you pray with me this morning as we look at these scriptures and think about what God's saying to us and just pray that God's spirit would speak. Let's pray. God, I want to thank you first of all that there's a promise in your word that you've made about it and through it that when it goes out, it'll accomplish a purpose that you send it out for. And it doesn't return empty. It doesn't come back to you void. God, it does what you want it to do. And so God, I'm trusting that today that there's a living word that we're engaging in. And I'm thankful also today that the primary teacher in this room is your spirit and not me. God, you know our hearts. You know the depths of them. You know our secret thoughts and you know our past and you know our present and mind-boggling uh, to us, you know our future. So God, I yield to your spirit in this, and I pray that the things that I share, God, would be true and would be right, and God, would be things that you've led me to say, but God, that your spirit would take these words, and God would just imprint them um, on our hearts and our minds, God, today. So as we read this, as we think through this, as we listen for you and what you want us to do, God, it would be more than just information that we'd be hearing. But God, it would be your very voice saying, this is who I am. This is what I have done. This is how I want you to live. And God, that you'd be pleased with the whole thing. Every part of it. God, what we hear and what we commit to. And God, what we do tomorrow and the next day and the next and so on as a result of it. So God, I ask for you to show yourself powerful here today. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to read to you a passage of Scripture this morning that powerfully speaks of who you are. I mean, I don't know what you think of as your greatest... Um, achievement. I don't know what is the highlight of your resume. I don't know what plaque or award you've got on your wall that means the most to you, but I want to share with you what I think is the very best thing about all of us today. And it's not because of anything that we've done. It's because of what God has done for us. And this is in 1 Peter chapter 2. And I'm going to start reading at verse 4. You can follow along with me in the piece of paper that you have on those notes, or you can read on the screen behind me. Of course, if, um, with your own Bible, it'd be great. 1 Peter chapter 2. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people... But now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. God's people. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, He does something more for you than simply take away your past and forgive that slate of sin and cancel that sin record and all the death that goes with it. He, he does something more for you than just put a promise in your head and in your heart that one day when you die, you get to go to a place called heaven, he puts a new stamp of identity on you. And you bear the very name of Jesus. You become God's people. That's a weighty thing. 
And I hope, you'll, I hope you'll struggle with the heft of that a little bit today and a little bit after today as you think through these Scriptures. And I, am, I have been called by God, His people. Once I really had no identity. I mean, I was a, I was a stranger and alien even to God. I, I was outside of His mercy and the only thing that I was going to get is what I deserve, which is the consequence and the punishment eternally for all of my sin. And now, God, because of His love for me and for no other reason, why else would God love us? Why else would God choose us? Why else would God save us? Except for the good that exists within Him. For no other reason but the pleasure of God who loves me and saves me and takes me one day to be with Him and makes me His people. I've got His name. And now because of who I am, there's a way that God wants me to live that's a reflection of Him in this world. His mission, His purpose, His name. I've become God's people. When you think about this passage of Scripture, there's so many powerful implications of this, of who God is and what God's done. It calls Jesus the living stone. Jesus is not a memorial that we gather here for. And I, I know that seems obvious to you, but I think it's something we need to reinforce in our thinking over and over again. We're not here today just memorializing this Jesus figure. You know, so much of man's religion is memorializing dead people. And we're here to honor and engage in communication with, worship of, receiving, hearing from, listening to the living God. He's a living stone. And He's calling us now to be many living stones put together. We were dead, the Bible says, in trespasses and sins. That means you're dead spiritually, cut off from God, and that means you're bound for eternal death, but God made us alive in Christ Jesus. And so now we get to participate in this life, this new life we have in Christ. As you think about this description of what God's people are, it should totally change your mindset of what church is. Church now no longer can be considered so much brick and mortar. It's not buildings and it's not facilities and it's not programs and it's not activities. It's this entity that's living and thriving and vital that God has put together. It's people He's put together. So many living stones that become a body, people, God's people. It's amazing stuff. This passage tells us some of the privileges and benefits it means to be God's people. And I'm just kind of break this down and then hopefully through these descriptions we'll go beyond just some facts and information to some implications for us, okay? So you be thinking and writing down not just the things I've given you to fill in. That won't be enough. But whatever God gives you to fill in, fill that in. Whatever God shows you about you and whatever God's Spirit, boom, hits your heart with, fill that in. Here's the first thing this passage tells us it means to be God's people. Look at the phrase at the very beginning. It says, as you come to Him... Now, if you're doing one of those um, tedious, um, often misleading, but all too commonplace sort of Bible studies where you've got a bunch of people sitting in a circle and reading this out loud and saying, now how does that make you feel? Um, or what does that mean to you? Um, you, you, might come up to, you might come up with a wrong idea, a misunderstanding of what this passage is about. By, by the way, if you're in one of those Bible studies, get out or either take over the leadership of it because God's Word says one thing. There's one right interpretation of every single passage. There could be many applications to the individuals there, but there's one interpretation. It's never about what I feel or even what I think because my feelings are often misleading. What I think is often wrong. So we've got to study and see what God says. But here this passage says this, as you come to Him. Well, there's a phrase there that's repeated several other times in the New Testament, and it's reflective even of an Old Testament concept that is huge. Now, we might miss this because I'm guessing the vast majority, if not all of you here, don't have a historic Jewish background. Now, Peter's audience would have, so they would have gotten this. What he's saying is this. He's making a correlation between what the priests were able to do in ancient Israel and what you and I get to do today as God's people. As people who put their faith and trust in Jesus. See, if you'd grown up in ancient Israel, you would know this. Only the priests had access to God. And they were the intercessors for the people. They were the go-between. And of the priests, only the high priest actually got to go into the Holy of Holies and experience the very real presence of God, the glory of God. And he only got to do it one time per year. And if he messed up in some way, whether because of personal holiness issues or because he messed up in some part of the ritual, then there was this nice long rope with bells attached to it tied around his ankle. And so when that bell stopped ringing, they know, oh, we lost another priest. And they pull him out. Well, now Peter's saying this, as you come to God, he's, he's laying down something for them that in that time and age would have been, it would have been paradigm shifting. It would have been mind bending. You get to see and go into the very presence of God yourself. There's nothing that's a barrier now between you and God because of what Jesus has done. 
Because of your relationship with Him, you now have privileged access to the Father Himself. And God forbid that we should ever take that for granted. That God is not a faraway concept for us to think about or postulate ideas around. Um, God is not just a system. He's not, a, he's not an idea. He, he, he's not a moral code. God is real. And because of Jesus, we get to go right to Him. You get to pray and talk to God. And you don't need my help or anyone else's help for that. You get to hear from God yourself. You get to experience the presence of God in you by His Holy Spirit. I mean, it's awesome. He says, now as you, as you come to Him, you have privileged access. Let me back up for a moment. Let me give you a passage to write down. Let me give you some, some reference, um, uh, give you a context to look at. Write down Ephesians, I mean Exodus, sorry, Exodus chapter 19, verses 3 through 6. Okay, Exodus 19. Here's what God did for His people. It says, now when Moses went up to God and the Lord called him from the mountain and said, this is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, that's Israel, what you are to tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasure possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to tell the Israelites. And then we fast forward to Hebrews, where Hebrews now begins to say, what is the relationship of God's people now because of Jesus? What has Jesus done? Hebrews 10, 19 says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh, and since we have a great, great priest over the house of God, and here's that exact same phrase that Peter used, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. He's saying when you became God's people, God gave you Himself. He gave you access to Himself. And that idea of priest is this. God's not calling you to the occupation of priest. He's not calling you to be like an Old Testament priest. He's saying you get to be as close to God as a priest. You have that unfettered access to God. And that's an awesome thing. He says there's a purpose in all of this. And the purpose is this, that we would offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to Him. What are the spiritual sacrifices that He expects? Well, He expects that we would worship Him, that we would give Him our honor and our attention. He expects that we would live in a certain way. There's a holiness requirement to being pleasing to God. He expects that we would declare the awesomeness or the, the glory of God. There's a certain responsibility in this. It's the obedience to God. And he says, if you'll keep my covenant, if you'll worship me, you will forever be my people. So you have this incredible access to God. But the idea of being a priest carries with it more than just your personal benefit. Now we could spend a lot of time here today talking about the personal benefits of knowing Christ and being God's people. And I'm not trying to give you a comprehensive message of everything that it means to be God's people, but I want to stick with the text at hand here, this uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. But to be God's people means more than just your personal benefit, more than just what it does for you. See, here's one of the problems we have with so much of modern Christianity, really I would say westernized, Americanized Christianity. We've taken concepts that are meant to be collective, all God's people together, and we've made them individual and personal. And so what that's left people with is an understanding of, a false understanding, that what we do collectively doesn't really matter so much. It's all just about you. So church becomes something like um, a beneficial option if you want to partake in it. Like a community organization or, or a, a, a society you might want to join or a club or, or, or something that does good deeds. You know, maybe it's, maybe it's the Lions Club or something for you. That's not what it's about. God has not just made me a person of His. He has made us collectively His people. And as His people, we're called to be His representatives. This passage tells us that we are now to be the representatives of God. Let me give you a quick timeline here, kind of a big, wide-angle overview. In the Old Testament, the presence of God was first demonstrated in a physical way to God's people and to all the people around God's people was when the nation of Israel came into the land of promise and as they traveled, as they went from place to place, God tabernacled with them, which literally means God dwelled with them. And as a picture of God dwelling with them, He had them build a tabernacle. When you read about the Old Testament tabernacle, that's what that was. It was a temporary structure. It was a tent-like structure. 
And it went with the people. It could be picked up and taken. And so wherever it went, and the smoke, and the worship, and everything from that tabernacle was meant to demonstrate to everybody watching, these are my people, and I'm with them. These are my people, and I'm with them. And it was meant for the people to declare, God is always our priority. Wherever we go, God is with us. We go with God. So it's tabernacle. Then God called his people to build a temple. And in a very exacting description, specific model, exactly as he wanted it to be laid out for a very clear purpose, because this temple was to demonstrate in a tangible way the awesomeness of God, the glory of God. Here's how you build this thing. So when people come up to the temple, they're going to be in awe of me. And everything about it is going to be going to tell a story. It's going to talk about it's going to talk about sin and how sin separates us from God. It's going to talk about sacrifice and the need for the payment for sin. It's going to describe in very vivid terms God's holiness and all those things would be depicted by that temple and it represents me. Then all of a sudden when Jesus comes, Jesus standing on that temple mount in in front of that building, that huge edifice, which would have been the grandest of its day, Jesus says something that causes the religious people to want to pull their hair out and his. He calls himself the temple. In fact, he says, this temple will be destroyed, and in three days I'll build it back. And they said, it took us hundreds of years to build this. How will you build it back in three days? And they were incensed at that sort of blasphemy, and Jesus was talking about himself. I am the picture of God among you. The kingdom of God is here, and it's me. Look, you want to see God, you see me. If you have seen me, you've seen the Father, because the Father and I are one, Jesus said. And now he is the picture, the representation in the body of God. What does he create after his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension? He gives birth to a church by virtue of his Holy Spirit. And a church is born. And now the church becomes the visible manifestation of God. You want to see what God is like? The means by which you are to see that is through God's people, the church. And that's a weighty responsibility. Now when you think about the implications of what I just said, if the tabernacle represented what God was like in His holiness, in His glory, in His worship, if the temple did that in even more incredible and more uh, descriptive and and more um, amazing ways, and if Jesus took it now to a whole different level, what does it mean now for His church to be His representatives? Because that's exactly what the Bible says that we are. 2 Corinthians 5.20 Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. God is sending us Jesus says, as I was sent to the world, so I'm sending you. Ambassadors for Christ. Listen to this. Think about this. Underline it. Highlight it. Put a big star beside it. God making his appeal through us. And what is the appeal? It's the second part of that verse. Be reconciled to God. I, mean, I, want you to, I want you to think about this for a moment, okay? I want to try to engage you in this sort of thoughtful process. I've gone over myself this passage. God says, here's my purpose okay here's my mission in this world i am reconciling people to myself people who have sinned and who are far from me and people whose lives deserve nothing but punishment and death i'm trying to reconcile them i'm trying to make right i'm trying to bring them back to me and how do i do it what that passage says god making his appeal through us i want you to think about this for a moment and again this is heavy stuff this is challenging sort of sort of stuff Imagine if every idea that someone had about Christianity, imagine if every concept of Christianity came from what they observed in our church. I mean, imagine if every picture they had of what biblical Christianity was, was what they observed in us. How we worship, how we gather together, how we engage in small group, how we talk to each other, how we teach, how we care for each other, um, the things that we do, what we talk about, how we live, what we do in here, what we do out there, what we do. What if their every concept of Christianity was based on what they saw in us? Would it be an accurate portrayal of what the Bible says a Christian is? Could they get enough? Could we be the people that that Paul said to the Corinthians, could we be those people that God is making His appeal through? And would what they see bring glory to God? Would it make much of God? Would what they see in us cause them to think this God that they worship must be an absolutely incredible God, what they see in us? Let me take that a, a step closer. Let's focus this in just a minute. What if it wasn't just the church that they saw and observed? 
What if every idea that a person that you know has about God came from what they see in you? What if every concept they had, what if every idea they had, what if everything they deduce came from observing and listening to you? What would they believe about God? What would they even think of God? What kind of reputation would God have if it was entirely drawn off of you? And that's heavy stuff, isn't it? That's exactly what this passage is talking about. We know what God has done for us. We know the grand plan of God and the goodness of God towards us. Peter just said in a few verses prior, he says, you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. Now listen, you are, you're my people. You're my people. You're just like Israel was in the Old Testament. God called out a people. And he called out a people not because he only cared about those people. Not because he only intended to work in among those people. Not because God was just one of those regional gods like so many people were. So, well, he's a God of this area or this people group or this cause or this need. No, not because God was some regional little demigod. He chose those people for a reason. He called them out for a reason. They were his representatives. And now the church, even more so, we are even more so God's people than Old Testament Israel was. Even more so. Because we, each who are part of God's family, know Him through Jesus. We each have experienced salvation through faith in Jesus. Each of us have been brought into this purpose. We all are His representatives, every one of us. I wonder if we have a good idea of how the world sees us. And as a result, how they perceive us is how they perceive God. Very interesting study was done. And this is not one of those anecdotal studies. You know, people can do studies where they, I was listening to something the other day and it said 20 people were interviewed. I mean, come on. I, you know, if you do a study that 20 people were interviewed, I don't even care. You know, where did you find these 20 people? They're all sitting at Taco Bell at the same time. You know, I don't even know what that study's worth. David Kinneman is the president of Barna Research. Now, Barna Research is a huge research organization that's been serving the church for decades. David dedicated a significant portion of time over years doing a study of Americans' perceptions of Christians or Americans' perceptions of the church. And he found out that they saw us specifically negative in, in six areas. There's six things that they said, this is what Christianity looks like. Do you, do you know how they see us? Now, again, this is not just five or ten people giving their opinion. This is not six or seven negative folks. This is not 20 people sitting at Taco Bell just got to do a survey real fast. This is several years of research across America. Here's what he found. Here are the six things that people said they saw about the church, okay? Number one, Christians, the church, hypocritical. Hypocritical, does that, does that surprise you? He says they say one thing, but they do something else. One of the respondents said, you know, they talk a good game, but when it comes to what they do outside church, it does not match. Hypocritical. Number two, he says they're focused only on converts. Their response was this. He says, I find, one of the people said, I find Christians to be insincere. It's as if they see me as a target and not as a person. And if they win me over, then I no longer matter. Is that how people see us? Now listen, it's not that conversion is not all important. As I said earlier, I believe everybody's going to spend eternity someplace. So that's not a side issue. That's, that's the issue. That's the ultimate issue. But perhaps if we took a biblical approach that says, you know, do your good works before men so they may glorify your Father in heaven. Maybe if they got to know us a little bit, saw us in action, and didn't see us simply as using them as targets or numbers, it would be different. Number two was focused on commerce. Number three, bigoted. Particularly against homosexuals. The church is just bigoted. They, they, don't, they don't try to get to know anybody. They, 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 just, they just hate us without cause, hate us with no reasons. They were perceived as being bigoted. We can come back to that in a minute. Number four, sheltered. Out of touch with reality. One of the respondents said, Christians don't have any idea of the grit and grime of real life out there. They're sheltered. Gather just with themselves and they don't, don't engage in intellectual pursuits or academic pursuits and they don't get their hands dirty with the messes of real people's lives out there. Shelter. Number five, they're too political. They're too political. They, they're, they're too interested in political things. Um, one of them said that their, their focus always seems to be a political agenda rather than a spiritual one. They're not interested in people on a personal level, but only what politics can do. 
Number six, judgmental. Judgmental. I wonder if I were to come there, if they would even accept me. I feel like they're too quick to judge me. One person says, I wonder if they really love people half as much as they say they do. Think about those perceptions. And then I want you to think about this for a moment. Where in the world did those perceptions come from? They came from us. They came from the people that God has saved, that God has allowed perfect access to Himself. They, co- they come from the people that God has identified with His own name. You are my people. They come from the people that God has said are to be His representatives. And I'm not sure how well we're representing. But yet that's our call. That's our responsibility. This passage tells us that we were chosen by God for sure. A lot of people get hung up on that idea of being chosen. We can't escape these concepts whether we find them confusing or for some even distasteful. We can't escape from the concept of the sovereign choice of God. I'm pretty sure that one of the reasons that uh, Peter so emphasized the sovereignty of God in this uh, letter to, uh, to this church, this group of believers there, was because they live in a world that seems so chaotic, so out of control. I mean, if you're not sure what's going to happen next, if you're not sure if the next knock on the door is going to be a fellow believer or it's going to be a Roman soldier ready to take you away, you begin to wonder sometimes, okay, is this world just finally spun off? Is, there, is it just totally, irretrievably out of control? And so he was reminding them that, look, even when you see evil all around you, even when you see all the chaos around you, you need to be reminded again and again, just like we do today, God is still in control. Evil does not hold sway. God still will carry out His purposes. But so God makes it clear in this passage, as He made it clear in the verses that we've read already in this series, that God has chosen us. We've been chosen by God. And you have to ask yourself, when you see passages like that, and when you see um, Scriptures that speak of God's choice, why? Why did God choose you? Why did God call you out? What, What was it in you that God saw They made it worth his while to call you out. If that's the way you think, you're totally misunderstanding God's choice. To say we're chosen by God does not mean that we are elite. It does not mean that we are choice, so to speak. It doesn't mean that we are picked among others. You know, when you go to the grocery store and steaks are on sale, and uh, you you end up shuffling through those three, four, five, you know, deep till you find the one that looks exactly right and say, hey, that's just got, that's got exactly what I want. I don't want any fat in mine. I like lots of fat in mine. I don't want to look like this. I don't want to look like that. You pick through and say, ah, this one, that's choice. I'll take that one right there. That is not what God did. That's not the image. Why would God choose any sinner? If God is holy and perfect and just and can tolerate no sin, why would he choose any sinner? He must have chosen us for a reason. What's the reason? Well, Scripture makes it clear. Deuteronomy even says about the choice of Israel. The Lord did not set His affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all the peoples. But Deuteronomy 7, 8 says it was because the Lord loved you. And what about the church today? If the nation of Israel was God's chosen people, and He used the same terminology that Peter uses now on the church, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and now that's the church. Why is the church chosen? Titus 3, 4 through 7 tells us, when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, He saved us. Mercy. To the Old Testament, He says, I loved you, and that's why I chose you. In the New Testament, church says, I had mercy on you. But listen, here's what you've got to understand. When He chose us, it wasn't so that we could enjoy this privileged elite status. He saved us for a purpose. See, this is something Israel never seemed to really grasp. In fact, you see this religious pride and arrogance throughout the generations of Israel. You see it especially magnified when Jesus came and so many rejected Jesus. Why? Because they were the chosen of God. Because they had this privileged status with Him, so they rejected Him. And some of the most inflammatory things that were ever said were things that reminded them that even though you're a child of Abraham, you still must be a child of God through Jesus Christ. Being a child of Abraham will not be enough. See, Israel was chosen by God so that the goodness of God and the rule and reign of God over a people and the worship of God would be contagious to the nations. 
And that's exactly what the scripture says. I'll read you a verse that sounds very much like it could fit in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, but actually it's in Isaiah, and it's about Israel. Isaiah 49, verse 6. Is it too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob, and bring back to those, back those of Israel I have kept? I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. That was Israel. You were chosen not so that I could bless you and in blessing you, you just suck up and consume every blessing I give, which is what Israel saw themselves as, these unique recipients and privileged recipients of God. No, I blessed you so that you could be a blessing to the nations, so you could convey every good thing I've done for you to the nations, that you would be a missionary people. They were to be a missionary people. Why did God call out a church? Not so that he could simply bless them and you could enjoy this privileged stage while the rest of the world does not know God and suffers forever apart from him so that you could be a missionary people declaring the goodness of God, the glory of God to the nations. And that's exactly what this passage teaches us. You are a chosen race. That tells me who we are. Look, verse 9 says this is who you are. You're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. And then the second part of verse 9 tells you for what? that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Don't ever mistake the choosing of God as something to simply be consumed. Listen, I know the fact that we're Christians what fuels our worship. And when you're singing songs that will stir your heart, I hope it's not just the, the melody or the tune or the beat or, or even the words. I, I hope it is the message that's reminding you of who you are because of Jesus, what God has done for us. And we sing this stuff with our hearts and we get into it because we get it. We know what God has done. But even as we celebrate what God has done for us, we need to always hear this voice saying, He has not saved you simply for your own pleasure, for your own enjoyment, for your own relationship with Him, so you alone could have access to Him. He saved you so that you could be His representative, so that you could demonstrate what it means to be a follower of Christ, so that you could make Him appealing. And as He makes His appeal to you, He's reconciling people to Himself. How good am I doing and making God appealing. How good am I at representing Him accurately? It's interesting, Peter references a few things, and I just want to hit this quickly. He quotes Old Testament Scripture here. And again, I think understanding the Old Testament that he's referencing was pretty clear to them. It needs to be clear to us for us to understand this passage correctly. You could call these the stone prophecies because they're references in the Old Testament actually to Jesus. And Jesus was given this picture of a cornerstone. In other words, here's the first stone laid upon which everything else would be built. Every straight line, every angle, the very structure and stability of the, of the building itself is all established on Jesus. And so what God is saying is, look, everything that's true and good and lasting must be built on Jesus. Anything built on anyone, any concept, any belief differently than Jesus will ultimately be undone. It'll collapse. It'll crumble. But if you want to build your life on the one thing that is certain, established by God, and will last forever, the one thing that the Bible says will never disappoint you, or as some translations say, you'll never be dismayed. It, it means that though the world turned from following God, and this is something the youngest of us in here need to understand, it's okay to be in the believing minority. Because the belief of people, or the unbelief of people, neither validates or invalidates the truth of God. God is not a popularity contest. He, he never has been. And in fact, as I said before, as we go through this theme of being a stranger in a strange world, there's going to be some power, I believe, in a true, vocal, believing, spirit-filled minority that God will use to draw people to Himself. When the, when the fluff is cut off, and when those people who's um, whose commitment is so shallow or whose beliefs are so flawed or whose hearts are really unchanged and they don't want anything to do with this Christianity anymore. By the way, it's just something shocking with you and this is not an indictment of the people sitting in this room particularly. But if we follow patterns, if we follow current trends, I want to show you what, um, what this is going to look like in just a minute. If you're 18 years old or younger, will you just stand up for a minute? 18 and below. Will you just, will you just stand up? Okay, I want you to look in this room at those that are 18 and younger. If current trends hold, three-fourths of these people that you see standing right now, sometime in the next five to ten years, will completely abandon the faith. 
They'll completely abandon faith. Three-fourths. Y'all can sit down. It's numbers that we've never seen before. The old ideas, the old beliefs that we know they'll come back. When they start having kids and they start, you know, dealing with serious life issues, uh, they'll come back. Your generation did that. This generation is not. In fact, the unreached people that we're discovering in the world all around us today, the, the unreached people that are now claiming to be atheist or agnostic or have embraced some other religious system, you know what we're finding them to be? We're finding almost 70% of those once asked Jesus into their heart. And someone reminded me the other day when they were, um, when so much was being tweeted about Miley Cyrus, I'm sure not going to go there. I'm not going to give her the benefit of much of my message time. Miley Cyrus walked an aisle, asked Jesus into her heart, and was baptized in a Southern Baptist church. We've got to be real about what the gospel is and what the gospel says. We are called to be God's people, to represent Him. Well, Isaiah is quoting these Old Testament, Peter's quoting these Old Testament passages from Isaiah. The first one he quotes is Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28, 16 says, This is what the sovereign Lord says. I lay in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. Whoever believes in him will never be dismayed. He's saying that Jesus is the sure foundation for man's salvation. There is no other. Everything else will crumble and fail. Jesus alone. He also quotes Psalm 18, 118, 22. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Jesus is the beginning and the end. And though they rejected him in his day and people are still rejecting him today, he still is it. He's still the thing you build your life on. He's still the thing that caps off life. He is it. He's everything. Jesus. Jesus alone. The rejection of men doesn't invalidate the truth of God. And he quotes Isaiah 8, 14. It's the last part. And he will be a sanctuary. But for both houses of Israel, he'll also be a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. There are many gray areas in religion. There are even debatable things in Scripture where good-hearted, God-fearing students of the Word will see things differently. There's one part of Scripture that is not gray at all, and that's Jesus. Jesus has always been very divisive. Old Testament prophecy said He would be. His very words were, and we still see the implications of that today. He says, for some people, I'm the sanctuary. I'm that which you run to, and you find salvation from this world, and salvation from your sin, and salvation from everything other than God. You find me to be everything that is necessary for you. I become the sanctuary. For others, he's the stumbling block. He's that, no. No. He becomes that part we we reject. We, We stop here. Why? Because the message of Jesus is this. I need a Savior. I can't save myself. And proud humankind, our typical human ego rejects that. I can't save myself. I can't just become a better person. I can't just do this. Isn't it just about sincerity? I mean, if you really believe this enough, no, it's not. You have no ability whatsoever to save yourself. You do not have the capacity. You don't have the goodness. You don't have the willpower. You don't have the strength. You don't have the holiness. You have nothing that is required for your salvation. That is the message of Jesus. I am your substitute. I am not an added benefit to your life. I'm not an add-on to make your life more pleasant. I am life to you. Apart from me, there is no life. For some, that's sanctuary. Thank you, God, that you're that for me. Brothers, it's, no, I'll not believe that. I'll not give my life to that. So it reminds us of this. We are called to be His representatives because ultimately that representation that we have, that status, that purpose that is part of that choosing is this. We've got a message to proclaim. Not just some beliefs to possess. It's not us four and no more or us 404 and no more, whatever the number may be. You're chosen. You're a priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're a people that belong to God that He possesses. Why? So that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out. You've got to tell the story. You've got to tell the story. You were given a story of salvation to tell the story. I know a lot of us have heard those kind of dramatic testimonies that are just, uh, wow, that's just so, so compelling to listen to. You know, maybe it's a war story, maybe it's a prison story, it's a drug abuse story, or it's a violent past, or whatever it may be. When we hear these stories, these testimonies, we think, wow, that's so awesome what God has done. I don't have a story like that. What am I going to tell people? If you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, as Peter said it. If you know what it is to have your sins forgiven, and have your life turned around, and have a purpose in heaven, if you know what it is to know God, if you know what it is to be in a relationship with Him, you have a story, and that's what God wants you to tell. Proclaim how excellent He is, because He called you out of darkness into light. Tell your story. 
Listen, I, I would challenge you today, in this world that we live in, sort of this postmodern world where things that we've always assumed to be true and assumed other people also assumed to be true don't seem to hold for them anymore. There's one thing that people will still hear and listen to. They'll listen to your story. And make sure that story is about Jesus and that it's real and what God has done for you. I know a lot of people quote this and they attribute it to St. Francis of Assisi, but he was smarter than that and he didn't really say this either. And I'm not sure what idiot claiming to be Christian ever did, but someone did somewhere and some have latched onto it. Preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. You know what? It is necessary to use words. In fact, if you're going to share the gospel, it's always necessary to use words because the gospel is truth. It's what God has done. And I'm conveying, I'm communicating it with words. We, we've got to do this. So here's the deal. We've been made God's people. We weren't a people, but now we're God's people. Peter's going to talk about more of what that means and the benefits of that. But it's more than just privilege. It's more than just status. It's purpose. We've got to declare Him. I know I've shared with you a fair number of statistics today, but let me share with you one more. This one really captured my attention. And as I began to think about this, I thought, how is this possible? How is this real? Again, a long-term study. This one was done by Gordon Conwell Seminary. And they have a particular research um, uh, arm. And in that research, they found this. And this was published in Christianity Today a few weeks ago. One out of five North Americans, U.S. and Canada, one out of five, say that they do not personally know any Christians. I want you to think about that for a moment. I mean, we got churches everywhere. Well, we've got people everywhere claiming to be Christian. And then you'll get these studies across the board. One out of five say, I, I don't even know a Christian person. I couldn't even name one. Yet, we are the representatives of Jesus. We are the ones that God is making His appeal through. There is no plan B. It is the church. And when this age ends, Christ returns and game over. It's done. That window's closed. We're the representatives. They don't even know us. Listen, we're going to have to go where they are. We're going to have to engage them where they are because they're not riding by on Sunday mornings thinking, hey, I wonder what they're talking about there. I bet it's good. I should go check it out. I wonder if they're singing songs I like. I wonder if they've got comfortable seats to sit in. I wonder if they'll be friendly to me. I, I, hey, I saw that message title. And that sounded really clever. You know, I think I'll go check that out. It's not happening. We've got to go where they are. We've got to engage them. If you think one out of five sounds tragic, consider how much worse it gets based on your different religious perspective. If you're Muslim in America, 42.5% of them say they don't know any Christians personally. But do we believe the gospel is for all people? Do we believe that God can penetrate the unbelief or the misbelief of a Muslim? 42.5% don't know any. If you're Buddhist, it gets a lot worse. 65.8% of them don't know any Christians. If you're Chinese, and I know that's not a religion, obviously, but if you're Chinese in America, 75% of them don't know any Christians. If you're Hindu, 78%. We are God's people. We've been given His name. We've also been given His mission. Now we know the benefits. Some. We know what He's done for us now. We have eternal hope and promise of what He's going to do for us forever. That's ours. It's secure. Peter's made that very clear. No one can take it from us. But it's more than just privilege. It's purpose. What do people know about God because of you? What do people see about God in you 